Um, awesome. And with that, uh, with that, we'll drive uh, right in uh, to this session. So we're going to talk about uh, CSP. Uh, where is it broken? And how can you can still uh, demystify and use it uh, for your uh, benefits? Um, briefly about me, uh, my name is Amir Shaked. Uh, I am a lifelong hacker. Uh, most of my years in the industry have been around uh, protecting or breaking things. Uh, and uh, in the past four years, I've been at Perimeter X um, leading the R&D, um, building some really cool security products. And with that, uh, we'll jump into a story. Um, so here is a story. Um, you get a call from the CISO. He's telling you he wants uh, to roll out a new requirement uh, that he heard about uh, to reduce the attack surface and improve the security of your uh, web uh, websites. Uh, he wants you to incorporate CSP. You take the task, uh, you read and understand all the meanings of the different directives. You add the header with the report only uh, at start and to collect all the different information, uh, see what you're getting and understand what's the possible uh, problems you might have. A couple of days later, you mark all the resources that should be allowed within your site um, and you see them as related. You add them uh, to the correct uh, CSP directives. You roll it out in, in block mode and you have zero issues with your website. Um, the interactive part here would be is has anyone here uh, have ever experienced uh, this phenomena? Um, and I'm gonna assume uh, in the instance of the remote uh, info, I'm going to assume that uh, no one has ever said uh, that uh, this worked for them uh, appropriately. And there are a couple of reasons for that. We'll touch on a few of those. But I do want to go on to another story that happens later that year. And this is a real story where you get the call from your credit card company telling you that uh, they've witnessed a lot of fraudulent activities from credit cards and they connect all those cards to being used on your store uh, within uh, a relevant time frame, uh, a week or two weeks before they were used uh, for fraud activities and they think you're the source. You dive into understand how can it happen? Where's the information? It's not even stored within your uh, infrastructure because they're trying to be as secure as possible. Even bring in a security consultant, analyze everything. Eventually you'll find uh, that some third party vendor that has a snippet within your site that uh, someone added uh, was responsible. They were breached, their code was changed and they're sending data to some uh, external uh, domain. Um, you fix the problem, but then you ask yourself, I worked really hard to add the, the, to have the CSP in place. I even added all the directives with all the allowed lists uh, appropriately. How can it be that still some cards got uh, stolen from the site uh, and uh, transmitted to, to another place? I'm gonna touch on, the, on some examples on how this can happen, even if you're doing everything uh, as uh, appropriately as possible. So what is CSP? Just in case somebody here doesn't know. Um, so CSP is a standard, security standard that was introduced uh, as, a, as a phrase back in 2004 by uh, um, Firefox 4 as uh, the initial uh, implementation of, of the concept. And then uh, at 2012, the W3C took the first version uh, live and launched it and browsers started uh, implementing the, the standard. And the most common version we have today is the version two, uh, most commonly adopted by uh, all uh, modern browsers. And the standard is basically to protect from two main uh, target uh, vector of attacks, uh, cross-site scripting and, and injections into the, into the page. These two methods of attack, when they're protected properly by uh, the content security policy, should dramatically reduce the attack surface of how someone can manipulate and, and steal information from, uh, from a certain website. Um, FYI, there is work on uh, the version three drafts, uh, still under work, and I encourage anybody here to review that and even add comments. I'm sure there is a lot of the, Many things the security uh, community can contribute to that. 
The problem with any specification, and this is another spec, uh, is that it never encapsulates the entire uh, problem it's trying to solve. It's never fully defined. There is always open questions that uh, a different uh, party is going to implement the, the, the spec uh, will have to decide on. And we'll show a few examples. And that will lead to inconsistencies uh, in how it behaves. Uh, the implementation might be lacking, even if it's consistent, it could be lacking. I encourage you to search uh, CSP in the CVE database and see uh, different uh, interesting examples. And at the end of the day, it's also very usage dependent. This is a policy um, standard, meaning that like any policy management, uh, you need to, to manage to run it and understand where things, uh, how things can be used and which kind of directives uh, you're going to, to incorporate. Um, and if we'll start talking about uh, actual usage, um, this is uh, data we collected based on the last two years of the HTTP archive uh, web scans. They scan around 4 million websites uh, a month and collect a lot of information. Uh, we analyze that information and uh, what you can see here is the different security headers within the, those websites, how many of those are uh, actually being used. And the top uh, and the bottom two lines are CSP. So all the other security headers, the, some of them exist for uh, much longer, obviously, uh, have a much higher usage. Um, and uh, do you see that the uh, CSP in blocking mode and CSP in report only mode are used a lot less. This uh, brings a question, which I'll, I'll give the answer in a second. How can it be that more is being used for block than for reporting? Um, and wouldn't sites wanna see what they're experiencing before they're actually uh, blocking uh, different kinds of things on their site. But we can see the even though the trend is positive and it is positive, it's very enlightening to see that uh, more and more uh, websites are incorporating CSP. Uh, it's still very relatively uh, slow, uh, slow process of incorporating that into, into today's um, modern websites. So looking at the trend, it might look positive, but when you're actually starting to dive into the different directives being uh, used inside the, the security policy, uh, taking the latest uh, information, this is based on the uh, October 1st uh, scan, breaking down all the different directives that are being used, you will see that the top three are actually um, a new version of the previously men mentioned security headers. So in fact, it's not really taking in uh, CSP as it uh, can be used and how it should be used. It's only using the uh, new versions of the um, uh, different security headers. And I'll briefly touch on these directives, but I think it is important to understand what it is that they're supposed to do. So the first one is supposed to um, rewrite any URL you have in the page to be secured. So you have an HTTP old legacy URL within the page. Uh, the browser will automatically upgrade that to be HTTPS. Frame ancestors will define how, you, how the page can be loaded from an iframe, from a meta, from an object, uh, et cetera. And the uh, block mixed content, again, goes back to secured connections and making sure you don't have a mix of secure and insecure connections within the page. Report your URIs, a destination to send uh, block or uh, reports to. And only 32,000 domains out of those 250 actually start to use some kind of directives that can clearly define um, websites where uh, content can be either communicated to or uh, fetched from uh, and incorporated within the page. Okay. Um, so one thing that was very interesting uh, when uh, I prepared the information for the for the for the conference, uh, looking at all the directives and, and analyzing them, 
I got over 300 directives uh, in those 250,000 websites. And there should be around 30. There should not be more than 30 as that's the bottom of the number that are, there is in the spec. So how does that happen? And then when we started to analyze the different directives that are being used, we find all kinds of common mistakes uh, people are doing when they're adding and configuring their own policy either irrelevant uh, content, forgetting to add the space, uh, invalid characters, some, and, and, not, uh, and not just a few, even uh, mixed between the header name and the header values. Uh, and the last one is, was just amusing to me. I don't know what, it was, uh, what they were trying to gain, but by using that, obviously not an official directive, but definitely um, inviting uh, for analysis. So if you are going to try and use and uh, create policies, make sure you're using something like uh, any kind of an, an official evaluator to make sure that the policy you're incorporating within your site actually works because the browser will ignore any policy that's not valid. The second is uh, whatever policy we added, um, we're going to look at the reports that we're getting um, and the reports will be JSON, all of them, and most of the fields are clearly defined uh, in the link you can see here and you should look into it. But you will find that the data isn't normalized. Different browsers will send different things and it's also full of, uh, full of things that are completely irrelevant. Um, extensions within the browser, injecting code into the page, and then you will get it as a, as a potential uh, um, invalid behavior, uh, which you have no control on and it's irrelevant. And uh, you shouldn't even try to manage that because all the browsers today, it's, it's clearly defined that an extension can just bypass the CSP because they're coming from outside the, the website. So all you need to do, you would like, just want to filter that out and ignore um, that information. Um, I think there was a question from the crowd, but I can't open it. Um, okay, where was I? proxies or other types of uh, um, tools that will uh, load the page within an iframe and might inject something into it will also create noise. Bots will definitely create noise within the information you are collecting. Even good bots, SEO bots, they will open the page with Chrome headless and they will inject uh, uh, code into the page uh, for various uh, reasons. Um, and you might get that as a violation uh, on the on your uh, reports, and I will. I want to jump into this example. Can you see my screen? So this is a great repository that captures a lot of those different weird uh, cases where people are trying to understand what's the report, what does it mean? How can it be that they are seeing that report on their site? If you are trying to analyze and, and deep dive into these and, and understand what you're seeing, I recommend you go into this repository and it will definitely help you to get answers to what you're, uh, what you're seeing. Okay. Back to the show. Um, another interesting uh, thing that uh, we discovered um, is browser misalignments and not uh, minor ones. Uh, um, I think that uh, was very, very obvious is uh, the behavior of when should a report be sent? Chrome, for example, sends only one report if a resource uh, was blocked. Uh, even if the page is reloaded, uh, as well, as long as it's the same uh, event that was blocked, it will only send a single report. Firefox will send all of the uh, all of the cases, so you will have multiple reports per uh, per page, perhaps uh, from one browser and only a single one from uh, a second browser. Safari does a, a bit uh, a bit of both. They will send uh, all the reports of every blocked activity 
but they're changing uh, some of the parameters. The block URI will be truncated to the top level domain um, as, as just as an example of another uh, nuance. And when you're trying to analyze from the information from the different browsers, all these misalignments and uh, information that looks very different be, uh, because of uh, bots and um, extensions and add injections will uh, really uh, create uh, havoc on, on how you're going to create your uh, whitelist policy. And you need to be really, really diligent uh, in the information you're uh, analyzing. Otherwise you might uh, add to the allow list something that really shouldn't be there. And it's actually not coming from their site or any vendor that you're using within the site. Um, with that, I want to jump into a few more interesting examples. Let's start with uh, implementation gaps. I'll describe one uh, such uh, CV. This is a CV that uh, we published uh, uh, earlier this year, but it's only one example. And there are other CVs that uh, describe cases where um, um, the, the policy might have uh, should have done specific things, but it's complex to implement it at the end of the day. And browser developers are doing their best, but there are cases where things are not aligned. What we have here is uh, a very common uh, part of a policy that we saw on many common uh, websites. And this should block the following behavior. You have a URL, uh, some code within the site tries to add an extra uh, script element loaded uh, with content. Um, so the, you, the document creates script, you set the, the source, and this will be blocked. The, the fetch event here will be blocked by this definition because it doesn't match the policy that uh, it was defined. However, with a few tweaks, um, you can see the difference of uh, code between this and that. Um, this will work. Actually worked and uh, no, uh, no browser blocked this, uh, this behavior um, and it was later patched within Chrome, so it shouldn't work anymore. But uh, this is an example of how trying to find uh, um, um, different gaps within the implementation will break it, even though you have a very strict policy that should protect you, but the browser just doesn't implement it uh, properly. Okay, another uh, interesting case uh, where CSP breaks is with the actual policy itself. You did all the hard work, you added uh, only the needed um, destination domains to be available for uh, location fetch, and it still uh, open, leaves gaps. And we'll start with the information. We took those same uh, websites and we broke the information differently. Let's take all the domains that are allowed within those policies and look only at those domains. What we have here is the actual target domains uh, without any manipulations. You will see things like www Google Analytics and the asterisk Google Analytics separately. But all the target domains that are being allowed by those uh, websites. And these are usually uh, big and, uh, and uh, reputable websites uh, using these uh, directives as we saw. Um, and the idea was, uh, let's take the first one. The first uh, domain that is whitelist, uh, let's see if we can use that for our uh, advantage uh, and uh, the fact that it's the most commonly uh, allowed uh, domain within the policy. The idea is very simple. You collect the information that you want and you send the beacon to Google Analytics defined it as the uh, user that uh, visited, you hash the information in a string, base64, drop it on the value, use a different um, uh, target ID uh, <clears throat> for the, uh, to send information to, to us. And uh, 
I think everybody here uh, knows there is no check on Google Analytics. You can send from the same page to multiple uh, target IDs uh, of uh, on Google Analytics uh, for different reasons. And with that, uh, thank you, Google Analytics. We got a, our very own um, a completely working, always working um, drop zone for uh, data that we want to exfiltrate. Going to our dashboard, Google Analytics, we can see that the page is the base 64, one click of export and decode, and we have the information we're trying to collect. This is in a way it's mind blowing because somebody worked really hard to define a very strict policy and they're using Google Analytics. It's one of the most common services. And, and uh, even after all that hard work, somebody can still try and, and, and abuse that approach and uh, exfiltrate information from within the site, assuming they had they managed to inject code in some way. Um, and I think uh, it is already a common knowledge today that one of the most uh, um, growing vectors of attack is not directly attacking the, the website. It's actually attacking uh, third party vendors that might have code within their site. Um, using those two approaches together, somebody can abuse and, and uh, exfiltrate information. First thing that came to mind was, uh, okay, let's uh, try to protect with the query params. Maybe we can uh, uh, configure something on the target ID for Google account and make sure uh, we can control where the destination, where the traffic would go to. And even with CSP version three, that's still not going to be supported. Uh, query params are not part of the, of the scope. And it's definitely something that uh, I think we need to scope within either CSP version three or four is what can we do to take it to the next step uh, and make the standard more robust and allow for such cases, mostly because commonly shared resources, commonly shared uh, uh, domains like uh, Google Analytics will only increase. And this is just one example. If I'll go back to the list, and I challenge uh, anyone here to try. I think it would be a great experiment and I would love to see it. Uh, you can try and target different domains and see if you can use them. If it's Facebook or even YouTube or Twitter, tweeting the, the credentials that you want to leak. Uh, paid services like New Relic, for example, it's still very cheap for someone to create an account and, and, and use that as a target. So all those common, uh, um, the resources in a way break the concept of having uh, clear whitelist uh, policies uh, which you can manage simply by the domain. And this is not just a theory. Uh, we published the method uh, early June and uh, less than a week later, several uh, uh, security groups published uh, cases where they actually saw this attack being used already uh, in the wild uh, with different uh, scheming groups. Um, and this is something to bear in mind. Uh, initially, when we published it, we said, okay, it's a nice concept. Uh, let's try and find if somebody is already using it. And very quickly, researchers around the world find ca found cases where it's uh, being used and, uh, uh, and targeted. So um, with that, let's, uh, let's go into wh where it went wrong. What's the actual problem here? The problem is, uh, as I perceive it is managing a policy um, does really hold in the way uh, modern websites are built. Um, same goes to why people don't like to manage uh, IP table uh, rules. Um, it's changing very quickly. The, you have multiple groups um, adding things that should be whitelisted and the site breaks all the time because you need very rapid, uh, very rapid way of incorporating them and uh, updating your policy. Um, the entire micro front end architecture uh, concept, which is, is a great concept, um, makes this even more challenging. How do you combine different policies and merge them? Uh, if you have uh, every micro component uh, with its own requirements uh, and its own uh, elements to be added uh, into the headers. 
And uh, at the end of the day, you need to constantly create the processes and control of what's being added to the policy. We saw cases of um, websites adding domains to the whitelist because it created some kind of problem to some of the teams and they just never took it off. Even domains that were obsolete, that were sold and somebody can just buy and, and, and use them for exfiltration. Um, because the reports, and this is something important to remember, the block reports only report if something was blocked. But if something is allowed, uh, you won't know if it's still relevant or not and if it's being used or not. And I'm gonna touch on an idea there on what you can do in order to understand if the policy is still valid, but you don't actually get any information if, uh, if the allowed list was being used. And this is another thing that can be interesting to collect the metadata of uh, which of the uh, different um, directives and target domains are, are being allowed. Um, okay, so what can you do and how can you make the best of it? Uh, a few Key takeaways I recommend you take if you're trying to incorporate and, and use this uh, use the security method, which I still recommend and it's a great one, but you need to take it with a grain of salt and understanding of what you should do when you incorporate it. Uh, first of all, and it's not documented in any way, but it's uh, very clear, the report doesn't give you any information on the user. And if you get reports from uh, in a different way from different browsers, you want to understand how many users users might be behind those reports uh, in some sort of way. So a very common practice is to add some kind of a user identifier to the report URL uh, itself in a query param or something like that. And then in your backend, when you consume the block metrics, you can differentiate between those different users and, and see what you're getting. Uh, you must filter the reports. There's so much junk there that's incredible. Uh, really focus on what's coming from the site and not from other places. And one way to do that is to uh, look only into cases where there have multiple users uh, with that report that will increase the chance that it's an interesting report to look into and not just noise in the system. Um, the next three lines are a concept around how you can uh, keep your policy tight at all times. So in a way you can A-B test your policy, um, use a stricter policy, even uh, very strict on the report only, uh, collect that information and constantly compare uh, which parts are being used and which uh, domains are not relevant anymore and then fine tune uh, your policy uh, all the time, you can do it at any kind of cadence, uh, every few weeks or every few months and, and make sure that your policy is up to date and things are still relevant there. And definitely clean up uh, and remove things that are not in use. Um, another thing that we haven't seen that much uh, in, the, in the research of how sites are actually using CSP uh, and we know it's a very, very meaningful layer of security is adding nonces or hashes into the CSP itself. That does help protect from different uh, attack vectors. And uh, the CV that I gave as an example, didn't work on sites that did have these uh, added uh, as part of their uh, policy configurations. And the last, I think is also a very powerful one is to be context aware. Set a different policy for different places within your site. Uh, if it's a credential page, checkout page, um, and, and other examples that can be relevant. Um, if you have a more strict policy at different places, you will dramatically reduce the attack service even to the point of removing common uh, shared resources like uh, Google Analytics, for example, from pages where you wanna make sure nothing can uh, potentially breach and, and uh, exfiltrate information if it's uh, critical enough for you. And I do invite people here to uh, contribute to the CSP3 standard with comments and ideas uh, and dive and dive into it. Uh, it's uh, 
it's a work in progress and I think it's uh, it's a really great uh, specification, but something that we need to drive info to, to improve. Um, some takeaways and then uh, we will have uh, time for questions. Um, I will start with the fact that um, schemers, uh, data schemers, different types, whether it's uh, credentials, login information, anything like that, are a new breed of APT and they are working very hard to try and find the gaps on any security measures being added. They took a very uh, direct approach of attacking um, the third party vendors and coming through them. Uh, and the CSP can help protect from those cases in a way, because even so if somebody comes from a third party vendor and adds code, they still need to exfiltrate the information somewhere. Um, but then you have the gaps within the, the way uh, uh, most of the allowed lists are configured. There is a way to exfiltrate said information to, uh, to relevant targets. And CSP is not a silver bullet. Um, it's a great uh, tool, but you need to add the process around it and not just uh, set and forget, um, which is a very common practice for policy-based tools like a firewall, for example, you set a policy, you set and forget, uh, it won't work here. Uh, it will open doors for, uh, for security issues. And uh, the list I gave before as a checklist of what you can do with your own infrastructure. And this is a great time for questions now. So, um, Amir, there, there are two questions in the Q&A. Do you want to take them? Yeah, sure. Uh, let me see if I can see them. Yeah. Uh, first one. So how can I define if a website that I have checked includes a policy that secures enough the website from different type of attacks and not missing some important directives? Uh, well, that's a, that's a, a big question. Uh, there are a lot of directives. Um, I will start, uh, there are examples uh, and uh, I can send a link later of what would be the most strict policy you can start from with a report only method see what types of uh, issues you're getting from your own uh, site and you want to keep it as tight as possible. So you can uh, iterate over the report only uh, policy and see if you're still getting uh, uh, um, violation reports. Uh, and when you're getting to a place where you feel it's uh, comfortable with it, uh, you can move uh, that policy into uh, mitigation. The difference is between the header of a content security policy report only and content security policy uh, without it. Second question. So, okay. First one is, is similar. So how can I know if the CSP is good enough? I think I touched on that. It's the process of iterating over it and not just to the reading of the policy. And if it bad, is a bad CSP better than nothing? Definitely. Uh, it is a standard and it's not an, a simple one, um, like any attack vector. Um, if you can block the 80% and uh, only the 20 most uh, uh, diligent and uh, sophisticated attackers are left uh, as, as relevant, you're still reducing the attack surface of your infrastructure. So I would use it no matter what, and I would use the, the directives, uh, the uh, more complicated one in a way, not just the basic ones like uh, upgrading secure and and, uh, and the frame options. Uh, definitely the source location should be added. Um, and even if you, it, it, uh, it's not um, holistic, it will uh, significantly reduce the attack surface of, of your websites. Oh, I see another question. Yeah. Um, okay, a uh, great question. So the question here is how would we, how would I fix the iframe problem I presented before? Um, that's a browser problem. You can't fix something that's uh, that's uh, improperly implemented, but uh, once it was found. Um, 
Chrome did patch it and released an update. So that's not a problem anymore. Uh, but I'm sure other problems will uh, will occur in uh, different areas. So that's the idea behind it. Um, so the thought process uh, around this is, uh, again, it, it really depends on your infrastructure and how secure you wanna be, but you can incorporate uh, multiple elements on the policy like the nonce and the hash and, uh, and reduce the attack surface. And, and if it's complicated to do it because of the amount of work it creates, you can do it and you can do it as a context aware, do it only for specific pages where you have um, critical uh, elements containing PII, for example, or things like that. And, um, and then reduce the amount of elements that can be added into those pages. So the amount of work required to, to reduce the attack surface would be greatly reduced. That's one approach to that. Um, we did see the actual usage of nonce and hashes uh, prevented that specific case, but that was an example. And I'm sure there are other gaps uh, that will be found. Any more questions from the audience? Amir, thank you very much for your time and a very good presentation. We appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great day.